everyone and professionals presented by Veronica Padilla and CT Hio. Please note that you can access materials for this session on today's live virtual conference platform within the description of this session. The session is being recorded and will be posted on our now conference websites and YouTube channel for broader viewing access after the conference has concluded. In today's session, you will be muted. Please add any questions you have to the chat. If you can also message me directly, if you wish for your question to remain anonymous. Uh, there is live closed captioning available and please click the CC box at the bottom of the screen to allow for subtitles. With that, I'm happy to introduce to you our presenters, Veronica Padilla and CT Keo. Veronica Padilla currently oversees the Department of Earth and Planetary Science as well as the Berkeley Seismology Lab. Veronica's focus is to integrate and leverage agile methods as a professional, be a servant leader, and give back to the community via public service. CT Keo completed her doctoral degree in Southeast Asian history here at UC Berkeley, where she is currently the manager of the linguistics department. CT also serves on the board of directors for a nonprofit that seeks to empower refugee and immigrant communities in Oakland. I'd like to welcome you both today. And I'll let them uh, speak a little bit more about themselves. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so as uh, Luis mentioned, thank you, Luis. As Luis mentioned, um, um, we are here for the first generation professional workshop. And um, so I think uh, for this workshop, we talk a lot about first generation students, but the goal of this workshop is to actually talk about first generation professionals. And really it's to give a name to the experiences of first generation professionals and the experiences and the struggles that we're all having. And I think naming something is it's a powerful tool. So that's what we wanted to do with this workshop. Um, and it's also that not only to provide uh, to name something, but it's also to give you tools in order to um, counteract or to manage the struggles and the emotions and the experiences that we have as first generation professionals. So like the model for the NOW conference is upskill, reskill and thrive. So for this workshop, it's really to help us and other first generation professionals thrive on campus. So yeah, that's, that's what we're here for. And I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, so um, the first thing that we wanted to do was who are we, right? Who are your presenters? Who, who are we? So um, we are women of color who are first generation college students from immigrant backgrounds. We are the first um, generation, sorry, screen. Um, first generation professionals at various stages of our career and life experiences. So I wanted to say a, a little bit about myself and my work trajectory and history. So first I wanted to tell you a bit about my background. So I am an immigrant, I'm a refugee. Um, my parents were survivors of the Cambodian genocide. I am a daughter, I'm a sister. Um, English is my second language. I like to hike, I, I like anime, and I'm, I like to read. Um, but I also see myself as a coworker. And so my work history and academic background, as Luis mentioned, I, I did my undergraduate and graduate school. At, um, at, I completed my degrees at Berkeley. And then I then worked as a admin officer at, uh, I transitioned to being a staff member at the um, College of Letters and Science D Diversity Director's Office. And then I worked with Veronica, who was my uh, supervisor at the Earth and Planetary Science and the Berkeley Seismology Lab. And then I transitioned to being the department manager for linguistics. Okay, and I'm now gonna hand it off to Veronica. Thank you, CT. Um, as you can see here, uh, I we share a lot of commonalities with CT. I came to Berkeley and did my undergraduate here. I got my BA in political science and Spanish literature. I um, I forgot to add the, the School of Law logo on this slide. I did my work study um, uh, years at the School of Law. Um, my career, though, started in student services as an undergraduate major advisor in the philosophy department. I then became a department manager <clears throat> in philosophy 
and uh, moved on to the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. And like uh, as said in the introductory, I am now currently in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science and also managing the Berkeley Seismology Lab, which is a research unit. I've received the BSA Excellence in Management Award twice, wonderfully nominated by my team. Um, but before this, that I call my present, I, I was a first generation student. So CT, can you go to the next slide, please? And what that meant is um, I had immigrant parents that provided me immense emotional support towards this bright future that I've worked hard to achieve at Berkeley. Um, so I'm about to get real here, folks. Uh, before coming to Berkeley, I benefited from the migrant education farm worker program and wonderful summer programs that they helped boost me up uh, in my education. I was a recipient of Medi-Cal. Without Medi-Cal, I don't know where my teeth would be, even though we couldn't get dental care in my hometown. My mom drove us 20 miles out, out of town to get fillings. Most white collar workers know they could donate to the Salvation Army. <clears throat> but my best memories as a child was really when my mom brought home a wonderful holiday basket from the Salvation Army donations with food and gifts for me and my sister. And here I'm moving on to the federal government again supporting me in a Pell Grant when I was a college student and my $4,000 work study award never failed me. So I want to be clear, this is not self-pity. These were all good things in my life that gave me a step up from where I was at. And then here's a picture of my parents. Uh, my parents may not have had a high school education, but they taught me tenacity, resilience, ambition, gave me a foundation uh, to strive for a better future. They instilled a value of education, persistence, discipline, and many more things that serve me well today. So this all influences who I'm here at UC Berkeley. So next thank slide, for, yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing, Veronica. Um, so we're now, so that's who we are. So I also um, wanted to give you the definition of what is a first generation professional. So um, the US Department of Commerce actually has a report and they have a program on first generation professionals. And this definition is actually taken out of their um, report on first generation professionals. And this is what they say. First generation professionals are trailblazers. They are the ones they are one of the first in their immediate families to enter the professional work environment. Parents' careers consisted of traditional blue collar positions or those not requiring a college education. They are professionals of varying social economic backgrounds, life experiences, skills, and talents that diversify our workforce. And when leveraged, they help agencies optimally, optimally serve our diverse public. So I just wanted to emphasize, like I put it in red, but I wanted to just drive home the point that first generation professionals are trailblazers, right? They're the first in their family to, to change their position. So, okay. But being trailblazers comes with its challenges. So um, this is also from the same report that first generation professionals are smart, innovative, resilient, and motivated. The kind of people who make great leaders yet some faced institutional barriers and personal challenges when traversing into the professional work environment. So I wanted to talk a bit about these challenges and I actually wanted to um, have you listen to some stories from first generation professionals. So. My name is Veronica Ronnie Venture. I'm a first generation professional from Guyana and I'm currently the deputy officer for civil rights and civil liberties I'm the director of EEO and diversity at the Department of Homeland Security. As with most parents, but especially immigrant parents, education and having a better life and more opportunities than they had was very important. Although my parents wanted the best for me, they were educated in Guyana and didn't know how to help me navigate through college. 
I distinctly remember how unprepared I was for college when I showed up to my dorm room with only two suitcases and none of the dorm essentials, like sheets. College was difficult as I battered the imposter syndrome. I had very little money and often feeling out of place as I was embarrassed to bring friends home on break and couldn't afford spring break vacations like most of the other students, some of whom had Porsches. Since then, I've learned to overcome the shame associated with my humble beginnings, even though I still live in fear that one day someone will notice that I'm not as smart or as capable as they think I am. So law school taught and prepared me for a lot of unwritten rules in my career, such as judges' expectations, etiquette, dress and appearance, and communication skills. So when I started my career as a law clerk and became a trial attorney, I was much better prepared than I had been for college. My mentors and social networks were not only important in showing me how things worked, but also pushed me to my full potential and provided necessary encouragement. I had a boss who took me under his wing and pushed me to take on a lot of leadership roles. He guided me, had faith in me, recognized my capabilities, and gave me more responsibilities when he thought I was ready, and taught me to be an effective supervisor. Whether because of a knowledge gap or feeling fear as an FGP, I still find it hard to self-advocate for myself in these situations. But it's important for FGPs to remember, you are worthy, you are capable, and you do have the qualifications. So another one. Oh, so I don't think I'm still over it. I still feel I have imposter syndrome. Even to this day, it sometimes creeps up on me. Um, but yes, so I have dealt with it throughout my career. Um, and so what I ended up, initially I tried to handle it or deal with it on my own, which I would recommend not to do that looking back. Um, I know early on in my career, I kept thinking, well, maybe it is me. Maybe I'm not good enough to be here. You know, and again, I was usually a lot of times because I was working in investment companies and large banks and working closely with senior management and executive teams, I was often the or the only woman or the only woman and minority in that room. So a lot of times I knew all eyes were on me and I would constantly question whether I was even good enough to be in that room. Um, regardless, even as much as positive feedback I got, how many compliments I got on my work, I still couldn't get rid of that. Last one. My name is David Zaya and I am currently the Chief Administrative Officer of the U.S. Census Bureau. I'm a first-generation professional from a small, rural-based community in Michigan of roughly 1,400 people. My father worked at the local a and grocery store 50 miles away as a stocker checker in the evening shift. My mother worked as a medical transcriptionist at the local hospital to help supplement income once my brother and I were old enough to be home alone. Going to college was always part of the plan for me, as my parents wanted me to do better and more with my life. I earned some scholarships as a salutatorian of my class, and the scholarships covered about half of my room and board and tuition. So I supplemented my financial aid with a work-study program. Having to balance work and school helped me develop a strong work ethic and a determination to succeed. My first job in the federal government was in the Chicago Office of Public Housing as a housing management assistant, GS7, with the promotion potential to the GS12. There are many ways in which I was inadequately prepared for my career, but this example of financial illiteracy is one I will never forget. I found a great high-rise apartment that allowed me to walk to work and get to know the city. Although I had never paid rent before, I did the math based on my annual salary and thought it was fine. But I wasn't informed about things like retirement, life insurance, thrift savings plan, and other deductions that mysteriously appeared on my pay stub. In the end, my first paycheck barely covered half of my rent and I quickly realized this was an unsustainable situation. I wish there would have been programs or classes to help think about this and felt foolish for not thinking about it when deciding where to live. My mentors and supervisors helped me learn skills that allowed me to be confident in my newfound abilities. I learned how to be a part of a workplace culture and how to successfully navigate within that culture through observation, commitment, and being genuine to my colleagues and the mission at hand. I think that my parents' example of hard work to provide for their family and sacrifices were massive influencing factors on who I am today. So, um, so in addition to having you hear stories from um, like the videos, I also um, wanted to share my own story. Like this seems really mundane, um, but I, I would say that it, one of the things that always irks me or makes me feel guilty is um, coffee breaks like you know how at Berkeley they actually encourage us to go on coffee breaks or to go on to these network like 
opportunities to network, whether you're going to lunch or whatever. For, for me, whenever I do that, and I still do it, but there's always a guilt within me. Um, like I'm doing something wrong and that I shouldn't be doing this. I should actually just be focusing on my work. Networking is not something I should be doing. Um, and I think that was, I, I, like for some reason, I keep on thinking that I might get fired because I'm going to, I'm going on to these networking meetings. So I, I think it's, it's just this weird, mentality that we or I have um, that I'm trying to counteract on a regular basis because networking is important. Um, so that's that's just my story. Um, Veronica, I don't know if you want to share or should we? Yeah. Uh, no, thank you. I, I already shared. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Okay. My name is Veronica Ronnie Venture. My name is David Zai. I'm a first name is David Zai. Zai. And I'm currently Diana. the Chief Administrative I'm currently the Officer. Deputy Officer for Solaris oh, okay. and Civil Liberties. Oh, sorry about And the Director of EEO and Diversity at the Department of. Okay. So I wanted to ask you um, what did you hear? If you could um, type into the chat, what is it that you heard from the stories that were just told? And then I will we'll give you a few minutes and I'll ask Luis to tell us what he heard, what was and shared. So, um, Thank you, everyone. Um, so, Luis, do you want to do you want to say a bit of, about what was shared? Sure. A couple of people said professional impacts of imposter syndrome, inadequately prepared, taking risks while navigating the unknown, feeling like they don't belong, constantly reminding self that you are worth it, not understanding deductions and retirement plans. That's a big one. Networking is important, though hard. A common message that uh, that I heard in each story was that everyone overcame their own adversities, but at some point still did not feel validated. Lack of guidance, feeling like an outsider. Uh, just a couple. Exactly. So thank you. Um, so I also wanted to um, highlight some themes that uh, I heard in the stories. So one is that a lot of the individuals were low from low income backgrounds. Um, they also had a lack, a lack of resources and cultural capital, um, which they spoke about. And then there was a lack of financial literacy. Um, like, yeah. And then there was the negative connotation of being first generation. There's the imposter syndrome, which I think we heard in, in a lot of the videos. And then there's racism. There's microaggressions and stereotype threats. So like, I, I think, so I wanted to focus on a couple of these. Um, so one that I definitely wanted to talk about was imposter syndrome. Um, so I think the quotes from the video was like, there's a shame of humble beginnings, um, a fear of not being as smart or as capable as people think I am, or maybe it's me, um, maybe I'm not good enough to be here, which I hope like, I. Um, anyways, so no matter how many compliments I got, I still couldn't get rid of that feeling. So like this, this slide is just really to provide names to the feelings. Like we'll talk about um, strategies to counteract this later on, but I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that these are real feelings by people that, you know, that I feel every day, that every, that first generation professionals feel every day. So, okay. Um, so the other thing that um, comes up is that um, not having the right background. So this is actually, so it's the Department of Commerce and the U.S. Census Bureau actually has reports and they've been studying this phenomenon. So I, and this is taken from the U.S. Census Bureau's report on first generation professionals. So like the person, this person was saying like, there's a CC carbon copy or a BCC, blind carbon culture, a car carbon copy culture, as I like to call it. Um, and the ki um, kind of like an offline conversation culture. Like I didn't know what an offline conversation was for the first two months I was here. I was embarrassed, but I had, I had to ask but I had to ask someone what the hell an offline conversation is. And I noticed it's a lot of those nuances. So how it actually presented to you, how something works versus how something actually works, um, they're completely different things. Like someone who's had professional parents, they might've been able to tell you that. So the report um, says, use this as an example, because the first generation professionals did not come from households with a background of white collar professionals, 
um, professional workers to mentor and orient them to a white collar professional workplace environment. Participants often describe being left out of uh, left to learn office culture and career path navigation on their own and while on the job, which is why networking is really important. And as a result, many professional work environment, uh, many participants describe periods of adjustments to white collar professional work environment that initially felt, for felt foreign and uncomfortable. Yep. So this is, again, just something that um, that's the structure in the environment that um, generates the feelings um, within first generation professionals. So what we wanted to talk about as well is on um, class straddle straddling and making it. So I'm going to turn this slide over to Ver Veronica to talk a bit more about it. Thank you, CT. Um, <clears throat> so as if it weren't enough, the struggle to, to make it or try to make it, um, there's this true thing called class straddling. Um, and there's some personal aspects of guilt like CT has highlighted for us, uh, for getting to where we are at, while maybe others in your close knit community, family, friends cannot, uh, or, or haven't been able to. Um, so you see here the definition of class straddling is, anyone of low income experience who has class passed upwardly. And for me personally, what that means by class straddling is uh, we've obtained privilege, like being able to have employment and office job. Uh, for me personally, maybe my cousin, sister, parents haven't been able to due to uh, different different histories here. Um, one personal situation is some of my family members have been undocumented. Um, that sometimes means that they're prevented from um, getting a, an office job like me. Um, that also means sometimes that I've been prevented from celebrating my own successes. Um, this class straddling concept is sometimes described as my more is someone else's less at any given time and vice versa. Um, and the question that brings that gets brought up for us as first generation professionals is what does that mean when the relationship switches? when you're used to mostly less, and then you're more. So ponder that question, what, that, that, what has that looked like in your lives if you're a first-generation professional, or if you know somebody that's a first-generation professional? Um, supervisors and managers here that are uh, supervising first-generation professionals can also think about this question and put yourselves in, in in our shoes. So life changes and all of a sudden you can afford things like scented candles or buying organic fruits and vegetables. Um, close family members earning less might not understand and ask why I'm not saving money. Um, maybe it's frugal to be spending the way I'm spending now. Um, they think maybe if it's not a need to have, how can I buy into the luxury um, and maybe see us as wasteful? I don't know. Um, as first gen, speaking a little bit to the making it and, and financial literacy, um, aspects of, of this concept is how do we know we are under earning? Um, we're first generation professionals. We don't really have a close uh, kin, parents um, that, that can help us and we need to network. We need to talk to our supervisors. So through the process, we learn new values. Um, we learn the value of networking. We learn the value of negotiating. Um, and being on a budget in history, um, 
of being poor creates also a lot of fear in us of losing stuff. Um, but don't feel weird. The, the point here is don't feel weird. These are true, true and real feelings. CT, do you want to add anything? Yes. So this is again about sharing stories and just being open and real about things. So I, I so for me, it's still that guilt and so like for instance my parents are still on government I grew up on government assistance um my parents are still on it they still get food stamps and it's it's weird um because I'm working here I work in an office and yet here are my parents um you know still struggling still going by and there's a, a weird you know like there's this weird thing where I'm like oh I could go and buy this but yet my parents are on food stamps like it's like that sort of thing, like I feel guilty for being able to buy something. Um, and it, it is also this burden of helping them and all that stuff. So like, this is what we mean by class straddling and making it and and the dynamics of all of that, right? Um, so yeah, um, so I, but I think we don't wanna end, like this section was really about the challenges and struggles and we don't wanna end it this way. Um, so we have this, Instagram thing where um, we wanted to end it on a more positive note. So like, I'm just going to read it for you. When was the last time you paused for a second and gave yourself the credit you deserve for how far you've come and how much you've grown, the person you've become and the transformation you've experienced and the tough lessons you've learned? Honestly, you should be so proud of yourself. And that is what we really want for everyone here. And I hope the managers as they're supervising first generation also convey to their um, direct reports is all of us should be so proud of ourselves for what we've overcome and gone through. So, um, and for being here today. I'm gonna, we're now gonna talk about guidance and solutions and I'm gonna turn it over to Veronica. Thank you, CT. So yes, yeah, so we have three learning objectives uh, under our guidance and solutions, and uh, we'll, we'll have some resources for you as well. But the three learning objectives I'm gonna take you through are to one, be proud of yourself. That's the transition from the last um, slide. Really, really be proud of yourself. And I'll give you some tips on this. Um, we're gonna go through si se puede attitude, and taking a first step. Next slide, please. So here are some motivational images to really honing in on that. Thinking about who you are, be proud of who you are. Uh, we've come a long way, uh, embrace your journey. Others will see you the way you see yourself. And so really do take time to appreciate yourself. Be kind to yourself with radical self-care. And as Spirit Daughter says in that third Instagram screenshot, the answer is you. Um, one tip here is to keep a folder on your desktop where you store all of your accolades. Sorry, where you store all of your accolades from your colleagues, uh, uh, your supervisors, and projects that you are proud of. Take it out when, once in a while. Look at the things to remind you that you are doing a great job. So, and label the folder. I don't know, CT the rock star. Put it on your desktop and refer to it. Also, Remember, it's not that you got lucky. Your contributions are, are, are real. They matter. Plus, there's a plus to this as well. Documenting how good you are helps you re remember during performance evaluation reviews or achieve together check-ins. If, if your supervisor doesn't remember, you can bring it up that you were really proud of these things. Next slide, please. So here we have uh, some an anagram on positive attributes of first-generation professionals. 
I want to credit here Oscar Garcia from Aspida Consulting. Supervisors and managers and hiring committees, you'll want to pay attention to this slide as we have a lot to offer. So we'll start with uh, F, fear. We embrace fear because sometimes that's actually what propels us forward. I, initiative. It is our nature and our natural ability. We've been going through a lot and we get ourselves to the next level. R, resilient. We get up more times than we fall. S, servant attitude. Now this one really resonates with me because I show up to work loving everyone I work with. And not that kind of love that I have for my husband, but a respectful love. That love that comes with what I do for others is how I want others to show up for me. T, tenacity. Relentlessness is that constant search for continuous improvement. And it, for me, it was wonderfully passed on from my parents to me. We're relentless in our pursuit of our dreams. G, gratitude. Gratitude helps you be happy. So we, and we don't forget where we come from. We are thankful for everyone's support. E, empower others. This is another one I really love. I also live day to day as a team leader, as a supervisor and manager. We have one hand up and one hand down to bring others along. And no, no is actually our yes. When we hear no, our heart and our actions, we always respond with yes, I can. We respond with a si se puede attitude. Next slide, please. So, si se puede. Yes, we can. Si se puede. It is an attitude. It is not just a saying. It is a belief. It is a value. It's an ideal. It's a guiding principle for an individual, a fam family, a group. It's, it's not only one person. It could be a whole group. So, here's another tip. You can keep a si se puede journal about your motivation for each day, what you set yourself up to do and accomplish. This is important because even if the item is to check off is today I will ask for help or today I will believe my, in myself. Today I will do X, Y, Z. Si se puede. Next slide, please. I'm going to show you some videos. And um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Order, people, order. I'd like a pan fried noodle, ooh, ooh, sweet and pungent shrimp. Ooh, ooh, okay, That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like our new friend slept in this morning. Hello, Ping. Are you hungry? Yeah. Because I owe you a knuckle sandwich. Soldiers! You will assemble swiftly and silently every morning. Anyone who acts otherwise will answer to me. Ooh, tough guy. Yo. Thank you for volunteering. Retrieve the arrow. I'll get that arrow, pretty boy. And I'll do it with my shirt on. One moment. You seem to be missing something. This represents discipline. And this represents strength. <laughs> you need both to reach the arrow. We've 
got a long way to go. So that was a little uh, scene from the movie, Disney movie, Mulan. And Mulan made it to the top. Yay. Si se puede. So I have another video, and then we'll have a discussion on the traits that you see in the videos. Sorry, next slide. There we go. You're right. I know you can. Lucky Finn! Now go! Hurry! Tell all the fish to swim down! Well, you heard my son? Come on! Sorry! You have to tell everybody to swim down together! Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Swim down!
they made it. They freed themselves. So this little clip is from also from a Disney movie, Finding Nemo. And they slam together. Can I'm going to ask and invite you all to reflect on these two videos. What were the si se puede attributes that you saw in the videos? If you can please put them in the chat. And Luis, if you're still there, um, can you read some of the comments, please? Sure. So we have coming in constant obstacles to achieve goals from the first clip, resilience, teamwork, cooperation, persisting, persistence, just keep swimming, perseverance, never giving up, uh, determination and working together, taking care of others. Once you find your center, you are sure to win, uh, which is a quote from the song that was played or lyrics from the song. Uh, those were a couple that came in. Thank you, Luis. These are all great attributes and I hope you, you know that these are all first generation professional attributes. We are determined and um, we take care of others. We find our center, we don't give up and we persevere. So just to drive this home uh, a little bit more, I have another set of slides that we can, uh, CT, next slide, please. I'm gonna ask you, sorry, look at this picture. Um, what is the person in the picture doing? Um, and is this si se puede attitude? If you can put yes or no in the chat. <clears throat> They have their head down on the laptop. Their arms kind of look limp. Is this si se puede attitude? No, right? Janet and Maida say no, that's correct. <laughs> Next slide, please. How about this picture? Look at the picture. What is uh, the person in the picture doing? Is this si se puede attitude? Can you type it in the chat, please? Yes or no? She's reading a book, actively reading it. Yeah. Okay, thumbs up. Next slide, please. Is this si se puede? You see her composition book closed, pencil down, and propping her head on her shoulders. Is this si se puede? Right? No. Okay. Next slide, please. You might recognize this is Dolores Huerta. She's at the podium speaking uh, for the podium says Department of Labor in the United States of America. This is Si Se Puede Attitude. Right. Next slide, please. Can remember, uh, is this Si Se Puede? This is a group of people high-fiving themselves. If CT and I had taken pictures together when we worked in EPS and BSL, this is what we would look like, <laughs> hovering over one laptop uh, screen. Is this si se puede? Yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you, all right. So we're gonna go through to the third. Uh, next slide, please. I want us to um, look at this quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. So for a minute, 
if you want to close your eyes to think about this, go back in time and remember what your first step towards what is now your future and back then was the beginning of your future. Maybe it was when you took your SAT or submitted a university application, your statement of intent to register. Maybe it was applying for a scholarship and getting it. You weren't sure what your future was going to look like, that you would have a career at UC Berkeley, but you knew that it was the very first step towards your future. So take this literally one step at a time and life will unfold before you. Trust that one actionable step will take you a few feet towards the destination of your future. And remember to trust yourself, believe, and have faith that success will be your destination and keep going, keep going, right? Use that si se puede attitude. If you heard the keynote speaker, remember that uncharted path that Dr. Tool, the keynote speaker talked about, the path will require you to take the first step. Next slide, please. Here I have an, another quote from Cesar Chavez. To make a great dream come true, the first requirement is a great capacity to dream. The second is persistence. So never forget how much you've overcome in those moments of uncertainty and entering new spaces as first generation professionals. The, use that feeling, it'll propel you forward and push you to enter new territories. If you still feel like the label of first generation professional holds you back, just remember that we had ancestors that were business managers, farm owners, entrepreneurs. The Gran Incas were engineers of wonderful pyramids of Peru and Aztecs, great astronomers, understanding the wonders of the world, being the first to create a calendar. You can peel back the label if needed. Next slide, please. So here um, I'm going to share, go through some resources. Um, let's start off with UC Berkeley resources. Um, here we have uh, links in the slide to staff organiz organizations at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm supporting the Alianza at UC Berkeley staff organization background. Uh, as far as first generation uh, resources, I recommend you look into maybe trying to join the new professionals network or the Berkeley Staff Assembly. I believe their um, Berkeley Staff Assembly or the acronym BSA, they have some mentor um, mentee opportunities through their programs. Um, so take a look at those if you haven't already and join. Um, staff organizations are a great way to also get some leadership roles. You can be chairs of staff organizations. Um, and sometimes maybe it's challenging to get those opportunities within your, your job, but you can do it in staff organizations. Um, there's career coaching on campus. There's the Wisdom Cafe. and um, it has additional resources to the Grow Today trainings online. Next slide, please. Here are some podcasts um, that speak to first generation professionals. Um, you might not know this, but UC Merced Chancellor Juan Sanchez Munoz 
He is the first generation professional and there's a podcast breaking barriers in higher education. It's an interview with him. Might want to take a look at that. Um, there's also Chicana code switches. This is just one episode in, in their podcast, Deconstructing First Generation Professionalism. Um, the podcast by Elisa Hernandez, Dr. Elisa Hernandez, is dedicated completely to being episodes of uh, showcasing first generation journeys. Um, so choose whatever your favorite podcast platform is and, and look out for these. Next slide, please. You've seen throughout the presentation, probably Instagram posts, and I'm a fan of social media. Uh, here are some recommendations if you want to follow first gen professional, Valeria Garcia. Um, she posts wonderful quotes, all of these, all of these people do to keep us going forward, reminding us to take the first step, um, being full of gratitude. The Happy Sloth Club is another one. Um, and I've mentioned earlier in the presentation, Oscar Garcia, you can follow him on LinkedIn um, and Aspira Consulting. Next slide, please. So in order to harness the power of Si Se Puede and of this presentation, I invite you to join me and Dolores Huerta in the chant of Si Se Puede. So if you haven't heard the chant, we start clapping slow and then fast to the same rhythm as saying Si Se Puede. So keep muted, but um, you can join in the video. Go ahead and hit play, CD. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you for being here with us. Yeah. Luis, do we have time for questions? Yes, we have about 15 minutes. Oh, OK. Is there anything else you guys would like to cover? Any questions for Veronica and CT since we have this time right now? Anything? We would also, I would also welcome you sharing your stories. I mean, because this is really about um, us together as a community to, you know, uplift one another and, and but also recognizes, recognize our struggles. So if anyone feels comfortable sharing or talking, with, um, I also welcome that. Uh, we have a question. What are some tips, best practices for networking? I'll go ahead and take that. Um, sure. Uh, I, I mentioned before um, staff organizations. Staff organizations are great. You get to people, you get to meet people outside of your department um, with within different roles. Um, you can gain references from being uh, a part a member of the staff organizations on campus there's a number of staff organizations affinity groups 
um, by profession. Um, there, there, there's a, just a, the whole lot of opportunities um, in staff organizations. I can't say enough about staff organizations. Um, check, check them out. Um, once you start participating in their meetings, they have wonderful topics to talk about. Most of them have, like I mentioned earlier, leadership opportunities. Um, and in places like this, uh, the opportunities to network by just being here at the NOW conference and um, chatting with people. CT, do you have something you want to add? I would also say that just, I mean, I feel like just by being here, you're also networking. So I think this is like that, that first step that Veronica talked about. I, I think you should take advantage of it as fully and as possible. If anyone wants to invite you for coffee, I encourage you to go on that coffee break and, and, and you know, like, or invite people for coffee. Um, I, I think that's also a very good thing, a more informal thing. Um, I would also say, I actually found, like, Veronica's a really good supervisor, and I, I, I also found talking to my supervisor about these questions were also really good. Um, so I think that is, is another um, avenue of networking that you could start with. It's actually, like, your supervisor is, is that resource for you, I found. Um, so I would also say that, like, coffee, inviting people for coffee, talk to your supervisor. And then um, the staff organizations. Is yeah. Other yep. Uh, while you're doing coffee or inviting somebody out to coffee, feel free to do informational interviews. Ask them about what their jobs are. What do they look like? Um, what skills are necessary? Informational interviews are great. Um, and don't forget to thank people when you uh, when they're when they're helping you out like that. But um, yeah, informational interviews while doing a coffee break, great. I have a question. Uh, what would you guys suggest or what would be a best practice uh, for someone that's feeling imposter syndrome uh, feelings um, when, they're, when they're working or in certain spaces on campus? I'm going to go back to that CSEP puede attitude. Remember when you've felt like that. Remember when you've broken out of the shell and, and, and um, shined through, Luis. I think uh, we've all been in those situations where we may feel like we don't, maybe we're not, we don't belong, we shouldn't be here. Um, but there's always been, um, you know, like I, I mentioned, taking that first step. There were times in our lives when I'm sure you recall um, breaking through, taking a first step. Um, <clears throat> And, and you can recall what, what, the, what you used, uh, the attributes to help you through those situations. Um, I mentioned a couple of times self-care. So breathing, sort of pumping yourself up for an interview, looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, si se puede, even if you have to like, you know, <laughs> talk, that self-talk. Um, that you can do this um, it is, is helped me along in those moments. Um, so I would say that I just have resigned to the fact that I feel like an imposter. I, I, don't, I, I, I know that's not helpful, but I guess I, 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 I've just accepted it. And, but I, I do constantly try to fight against it and, and, and reaffirm to myself that I can do this. I am, I am good enough. And those accolades are true and that I am, I, I work hard and I, there's a reason why I'm here. So I, I, a part of me has resigned and accepted it, but another part of me is also like, okay, this is how I feel. So I'm just going to keep on pushing through and just keep going. And I, I really do like Veronica's tip of having that folder of just like, CD's a rock star. Um, I, I think you have to remind yourself that you're cons that you deserve to be here and that you have done so much to be here. And um, yeah, so I, it, it's, it's, it's a very psychological trick that you have to play on yourself. Um, so that, yeah, I, I wish I had a better answer, but this is just what I, I go through, so. 
Yeah. Uh, what are some ways to navigate microaggressions from coworkers or even supervisors? I would say acknowledge um, if you're feeling that something, you know, um, wasn't right. You can question it. You can say, well, what did you mean by that? Um, and you can, um, so, so questions are super powerful. Um, I want to kind of jump back to your previous question, Lise, like, um, you can ask for feedback. We are, we, we are super coachable. We've been coached our whole lives. Like people have been helping us and we help others. Somebody has always been lending a hand to, to jump up, to, to go up, um, um, from situations. So, um, you know, ask for feedback. Um, if you, if you need reassurance of, um, and I strongly suggest that supervisors and managers of first generation professionals reassure us, um, validate us, and we are super coachable if we're not doing it, I don't know, the right way or um, tell us, tell us, right? Um, so in micro, going back to the next question, Lisa, of microaggressions, um, question it as well. Like, what did you mean? Um, Hopefully, you don't have to resort to the bullying policies, but there are also, if it gets to a point of you feeling bullied, you know, speak to your supervisor. There are bullying campuses, bullying policies on campus um, that help address grave situations. Uh, there's ombuds. If you need to have some conflict resolution. There are resources you can ask and be directed to resources on campus. And hopefully there are allies around that are, that are you know, if there's bystanders that can help intervene, ask for help. Uh, and there was a question on uh, tips on navigating male-dominated workspaces in, in your perspective and your roles right now. I'm sorry, could you say that again, Luis? I missed that. Tips on, tips on navigating male dominated spaces or workspaces. Um, and and, and, and I guess in thinking about uh, your current roles and where you're at right now and, and navigating that to where you're at. These are such hard questions. I wish, um, how do you navigate it? I, so I, and I'm not saying that this is fair. Um, I probably navigate it by trying to be super uber uber prepared for things. Um, that's that's how I I do it. I I guess I I fall back into the um, if I could just prepare myself and then handle or um, expect these things and just you know yeah just be as prepared and as possible as I can be is how I do it. Um, and that's just me being me and being real. I, I can't, um, yeah, Veronica, I'm gonna leave you to answer that question, but it, yeah. Uh, you may want to, it's a broad topic. Um, you're probably gonna to want to break it down, me being like somebody that breaks down to try to find the, the crux of, maybe what doesn't jive with you or what's what's really being an obstacle or a challenge. Um, so really break it down to where the issue is stemming from. Um, and again, resort to being proud of who you are. You have skills. You, it's, it, you ha your contributions are real they matter. Um, if you need um, somebody to sponsor you, um, you can ask to be sponsored and, and usually bringing somebody along um, that's an ally uh, to help um, support you. Um, I think it goes back to being confident, asking for help, 
if needed, um, and and asking for guidance and being coachable um, when you're getting and receiving feedback. So I, I just would so I would say that the thing that has really helped me in navigating all of this is having an ally and a person who says I'm great and I'm wonderful, which is Veronica. <laughs> you know, like having those people around you that will validate you and just make you feel confident is, is, is probably one of the, the greatest gifts that you could have. And um, I would be like, try to do everything in your power to find those group of people, I would say. So, yeah. And I think uh, just to wrap it up, uh, final thing you would leave the, 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 um, the audience here with uh, in regards to first generation professionals. I would say network and finding a mentor. Um, I would say that that's probably the key um, thing that I would recommend for people. For me, uh, I, as you saw from the slides, it's the yes, we can attitude, si se puede attitude. Uh, keep, keep, it's, it's a daily practice. It, and reinforcing your attitude. Like I mentioned, a si se puede journal. It should be your motivation. It should be um, where you set yourself up to accomplish more. And again, don't, don't, don't forget, even if the accomplishment is to ask for help, um, that should be a priority for you if, if, that's, that, if the issues stem from that. Or, even believing in yourself. It's daily affirmations for yourself um, and taking care of yourself. Um, making time for, for working out, making time for that coffee break, take care of yourselves. Um, it, it, it all helps. It all helps to, to build yourself up, to give, give you that, um, like my dad would say, Dale batería, give yourself some batteries um, to pump, to get pumped up and to do and accomplish the things that you're set out to do. Si se puede. Thank you so much, CT and Veronica, for this great presentation. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed. Um, just a couple of things. Everyone, please remember to complete the session evaluation. I dropped it in the link. Um, I believe we're going to pop it up in a QR code. So if you can go ahead and scan that um, on screen, uh, it will redirect you to that session evaluation. Uh, next up is our mid-morning activity break at 11.10 a.m., which will be an energizing drink demo with Deepak Sharma. You can watch by clicking on the link under the activity break description on the live conference website. After the activity break, you'll also want to be ready for our second round of concurrent sessions, which will begin at 11.25 a.m. Uh, and I hope you guys are enjoying your sessions and uh, we hope to see you uh, at our upcoming sessions this, this today. <laughs> and thank, thank, you thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you all for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. Thank you all. Don't forget, please scan the QR code and fill out your session evaluations. Thank you.